Assalamu alaikum everybody and welcome everyone who has joined us today for the webcast. National Incubation Center in Lahore is pleased to welcome our online audience to a discussion on health tech opportunities in its Entrepreneur in Conversation series featuring some of Pakistan's brightest entrepreneurial mind discussing their innovative solution to combat country's many challenges. Through this series, NIC is aiming to provide young entrepreneurs a platform to engage directly with the industry leaders and learn firsthand from their startup journeys. The speaker series highlights their successes and failures, and more importantly, how they overcame challenges to create enduring success. These innovators, such as our audience and the panel today, and disruptors in, and visionaries have succeeded in the industry and have built companies that are outside of their At NIC in Lahore, we have the six month long foundation program designed to help Pakistani entrepreneurs develop their ideas into investor ready business plan and benefit from a network of experts and business leaders, culminating in a Capstone's Investors Summit. The Foundation Council selects the participants and oversees the program delivery, which is funded by Ignite, a government body. The renewed vision for NIC is to focus on problem areas and high impact for Pakistan, including health, application of machine and artificial learning, and also uh, the area of biotechnology. The whole University of Management Science, LUMS, is Pakistan's premier management university. And Suleiman Daud School of Business is Pakistan's top business school. LUMS is ranked among the top 50 universities in Asia and top 200 worldwide. SDSP, the business school, is the only business school accredited by AACSB International. SDSP is also the Harvard Business Publishing Content Partner, and more than 80% of our faculty members hold a PhD from world's leading institute. At LUMS, we started the Master of Science degree in healthcare management and innovation, which is a one and a half year program envisioned to provide intensive, rich and innovative understanding of intersection between business fundamentals and healthcare area. A blended learning approach of online and on-campus sessions exposes our students to the new realities of business world. It reinforces student-centered learning by providing a truly transformative and interactive experience. Blended learning technique throughout the Master of Science studies will present students with a diversity of instructional approach, learning techniques, case studies, reading, role play, and industry engagement. Today, we are joined by our esteemed guest, Mr. Faisal Mustar, Senior Vice President at Change Healthcare a 13 billion US healthcare technology company focused on inside innovation, accelerating the transformation of US healthcare system. Faisal Saab would share his two decades of experience in utilizing technology across the healthcare delivery system in US and opportunities for Pakistani entrepreneurs to transform Pakistan's healthcare system. Later, we will be joined by Hamza Iqbal, founder and CEO of HealthWire, and a graduate of NIC Lahore, who will share Pakistani perspective from his experience in building a health tech startup. Faisal Saab has been at healthcare industry since 2000 and has extensive entrepreneurial business experience. He has led teams of all sizes, spanning many organizational areas, including portfolio strategy, sales, business development, technology, operations, software development. Faisal Saab, as the senior vice president and general manager of Clinical Network, leads the business lines focused on enabling clinical connectivity for change healthcare clients across the care setting. Most recently, Faisal Saab was the president and CEO of Travis, a venture-funded healthcare IT company focused on managing the pharmacy spend for Fortune 1000 and government entities in US. Previously, Faisal Saab was the senior vice president and general manager for payer and life sciences business in Allscript. That business focused on bringing innovative solution across the entire healthcare value chain, 
generating immediate value for providers and patients in leveraging clinical data, adherence and education messaging infrastructure to enable improved clinical outcome. To his credit, in his eight years at Allscript, he was one of the executive leaders responsible for growing the company from 350 million to over 1.6 billion in annual revenue. Before Allscript, Fethusab worked for Chief Product and Development Officer at Neopharma, Chief Product Officer at Biz360, Chief Operating Officer at Cracksoft. Fethusab completed postgraduate studies at Harvard Business School and earned a BS Computer Science and Electrical Engineering from University of Wisconsin and Medicine. Fethusab, to his credit, also co-authored five patents and has served as a board member as various entrepreneurship and industry development organization. Some of the figures at his current company speak volume about his achievement. The company collectively saved 10 billion per year for its payer customers, 1 million physician and 6,000 hospital in the US depend on their platform. One in three patient record cross their company's platform. 92% of US health plans turn to change healthcare. As I said earlier, Fasasab earned bachelor's in science degree in computer science and computer engineering from University of Wisconsin. And he has also completed advanced management program at Harvard Business School. Welcome Fasasab, it's a pleasure to have you in our forum. To start off, uh, can you for the benefit of our audience explain how did a non-medical graduate get interested in application of technology in the maze of healthcare industry? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Kashif. Thank you for very kind words. Um, so I'm uh, speaking to you from New York area where it's freezing and snowed all day yesterday. So I, once I'm done here, I'm gonna go outside and uh, clean up the driveway so I can take my car out. <laughs> so with that, a little bit of uh, uh, you know personal information. So I got into healthcare in, in the year 2000. Honestly, it was not a very uh, thoughtful or deliberate decision. I grew up uh, as a software engineer, <clears throat> programming mostly telecommunication systems. And uh, an opportunity came up that uh, leveraged my software development experience in healthcare. So since that time, you know, once I got in, it, it became quite clear that this is something I wanted to do primarily for, for a few reasons. Um, one of the first reasons is healthcare is not necessarily a career. Healthcare is a mission. Uh, for most of you, I would imagine it's the same, you know, because there are many ways to make uh, a living and there are many ways to uh, do the right thing. But when you work in healthcare, not only are you uh, able to make a good living, you're also able to do the right thing, help patients uh, get healthcare, uh, which sometimes is not available, other times it's not uh, feasible, and in, in most cases, it's not affordable. So thinking about healthcare, um, it's not a, you know, so I'm not, I'm not any different from a lot of, a, a lot of people that work in healthcare in the US. I don't have a medical degree. So having a medical degree helps, but not having a medical degree is not a barrier to entering healthcare. And the reason for that is um, the way healthcare is organized in the US is healthcare is a business. And just like anything else in life, when you are running a business, you need business people. So purely from an entrepreneurial perspective, we do see a lot of healthcare entrepreneurs have medical degrees, but at the same time, that is not the only path to growing and building a healthcare business. Uh, because there is a lot of business aspects of healthcare. There's enormous amount of software technology that gets involved in building a healthcare business. So the opportunities, the way I think about it is, and actually I have a talk coming up at my university, uh, maybe in, uh, I think a couple of months where I'm speaking to the computer science department and the uh, uh, medical school, uh, the lawyer, uh, the law school, 
and public health schools. So four schools have come together and they're sponsoring my talk because fundamentally healthcare needs all of these four things to come together. Um, and, and without these four things, it's very hard to do much in healthcare because it's such a deep and diverse business. Uh, in some places, you know, supply chain is more important. In other places, um, healthcare, knowledge of healthcare itself is very important. And in other places, technology is very important. So I think it's, it's I'm, no, I'm not an exception to the rule. Um, there are lots of people who are in my positions who are not medical experts or medical professionals with medical degrees. But at the same time, you know, a lot of the new companies or entrepreneurial companies are usually started by healthcare professionals in partnership with the business person. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, it's always important and, and the there is a reason for it, at least in context of US. In the context of US, if you are a healthcare professional, you have a lot more credibility with the patient and with the doctor. So if with me, me without having a medical degree, I mean, there's nobody stopping me from starting a business. But when I go to a doctor and say, you should use this because it's going to be clinically helpful to you, he or she may look at me and say, what do you know about it? You don't know much about it. You don't live my life. You don't understand my problem. Even if I do, that's not something that comes naturally to a lot of people. So an ideal structure, at least in the US, is a healthcare professionals team up with a business person or a technology person, depending on whatever is missing. And usually healthcare startups are co-founded by two people or more. It's, it's rarely one person um, because of the amount of uh, work that have to be done. And so it's not, it's, not, um, it's not out of the ordinary. So if you are not a healthcare professional uh, with a um, healthcare degree, be it a pharmacy, dental, uh, medical, uh, otherwise, it doesn't mean that you can't be a healthcare entrepreneur, at least in the US. Yeah, so uh, if you share your experience of the last two decades in US healthcare technology, how has that evolved? Uh, in that sector? So, like I said, I started out, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a computer programmer by education. And, um, you know, I did a lot of that before I got into management. So the way, you know, this, is, this also helps explain how diverse healthcare is and the opportunities that healthcare has. So I started out by working in the supply chain of healthcare, hmm. which is, how do you, you know, hospitals buy a lot of things, medication, bedpans, sutures, gloves. There's an enormous amount of buying that hospitals do. And in order to improve the buying process and the purchasing process, there is a lot of uh, supply chain oriented companies that are focused purely on healthcare. So I started my career in working in supply chain of healthcare, which I call the commercial side of healthcare. And over a period of time, I transitioned to the clinical side. So fundamentally in healthcare, there are multiple domains. So one is the supply chain domain. If you're, if you are researching a drug, once you have developed a drug, you have to find a way to supply it all across the country or all across the globe, whatever your market is. So there's a lot of opportunity for supply chain people in healthcare, that's number one. The second one is there's a lot of opportunity of building clinical applications, which are things that a physician uses, systems, EMR systems um, that are very critical, clinical decision support systems that are built um, for clinicians, be it a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, or a lab technician, um, you know, anybody who's involved in, in delivering healthcare. So that domain is considered a clinical system domain. And then the third one is the revenue cycle, which is probably a much easier problem in, the, in Pakistan than it's in the US, primarily because a lot of healthcare in the US is delivered um, through um, 
insurance. So once a patient sees a doctor, the patient does not necessarily pay the bill, it's the insurance pays the bill. So they're very, there's a very comprehensive, and in my opinion, a very convoluted uh, payment system, which, has, which requires a lot of paperwork. And so there's a third domain, like I said, is a revenue cycle domain, where you are managing the billing, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and it's easier said than done because you know, health plans will come back and say, why did you give this medication to this person? We, are no we don't think it's medically necessary. Because of those controls and bureaucracy, the simple process of billing and receiving money is extremely complicated. And it takes a lot of time for the doctors or hospitals to collect their money. So there is an entire domain and uh, Change Healthcare, my company, we are the number one provider of revenue cycle systems in the, in the country. Uh, you know, I, I would just comment that. So that's the third domain. And then there's a fourth domain where, it, where it's all about, uh, uh, it's all about uh, providing uh, systems for patients. They're not considered clinical systems. They're not considered financial systems. They're considered patient facing systems which is where I think Hamza is, is um, the initial focus is on building these portal for physician patients who can schedule appointments, et cetera. So when you engage with patients, there is a very different way to think about how patients will engage with you and how they will use you, which could be very different from how physicians want to engage with you. So that's a fourth domain. And then there is a fifth domain, which is about pharmaceutical medication. So the domain of developing drugs, getting them approved, and then getting them distributed. And that in itself is a mega billion dollar business in, in healthcare. So these are all, all of these things are considered all part of healthcare. And as you said, you know, as, as I said earlier, you know, as you think about it, you know, just, just so the healthcare is so broad that it offers enormous career opportunities for lawyers, for uh, medical professionals, for supply chain people, for, for scientists who are, who are either de delivering, uh, creating new molecules or are, uh, are involved in uh, production of medication. And uh, for people such as UI designers who actually understand how Patients want to engage with their healthcare, and um, and then, like I said, computer scientists, uh, business people. So it's it's an enormous opportunity for all of these people um, uh, to to contribute and make healthcare better. And one of the things you talk about in your uh, health uh, is about single platform, where you actually simplify the process. You just mentioned the different domains. Can you just explain to us like what does the single and how does it help to access and share some of the sensitive information and how does it help the end user in terms of the faster and coordinated seamless patient care? So, you know, so the US healthcare system has evolved over the last 50, 60, 70 years and really took off when social security and Medicare, Medicare is the US government funded health insurance for seniors over the age of 65. So when the US government got involved in providing healthcare to older Americans, that's when healthcare really took off because then there was an organized payer, US government that was paying for services. Before that, it was very, very similar to where Pakistan is today, which is if you can afford it, you can go to the best place possible if you can't afford it, you either don't go or you suffer the consequences uh, because it's an access issue, it's a affordability issue. So what the US government did uh, you know, with, the, with the Medicare program, which is the US government senior healthcare program, health insurance program, is made that a non-issue for, for seniors or people over the age of 65. So we have to keep that in mind that because of that, the US healthcare IT systems or services delivery systems have been built over a period of time. And when you build 
over a period of time where there is continuously changing regulations, you're not going to have the best thing out there because it's just going to be siloed everywhere. Uh, things would be, uh, you know, so for example, in, in a single hospital, in a mid-sized US hospital, which was maybe a thousand beds. So the way they measure the hospital sizes here in the US is by the number of beds. So large hospitals are considered, you know, hospitals with more than a thousand beds. Mid-sized hospitals are anywhere from, you know, 200 to 1,000 beds. And small hospitals have less than 100 or 200 beds. Because all these three hospital types need different systems. They need different level of maturity. They can afford different type of systems. So as, as these uh, large hospitals are, are, in an average, a U.S. hospital has 30, 30 different software systems. Why? Because they have supply chain system, they have a blood bank system, they have lab system, they have billing system, they have EHR system in the outpatient, they have EHR system in the inpatient, they have a EHR system in the dental practice. It's a nightmare. So fast forward today, whatever made sense, you know, it doesn't make any sense now, but replacing everything is going to be, it's going to take God knows how long, may not be in my lifetime. So this is one of those places where Pakistan has an enormous opportunity to bypass you know, all of that nonsense and start to organize itself around these units of care. So if a health system or a hospital is a unit of care, bring all the different things that are needed inside a unit of care, at least from a clinical perspective. So there is there needs to be you know thought on one building one clinical system that can support all different specialties, including dental and mental health, and then there needs to be a single system that can deal billing for all these different specialties, and then there needs to be one supply chain system that can deal with all the supply chain, which we call the you know the the loading dock, all the supplies that come in at the loading dock and how they get categorized, you know, inventory management, all these things, all of those things need to be managed as a single. So talking about data exchange, what happens today is if I go to a doctor at, let's say, you know, let's use an example, any, any hospital. And I say, you know, and they look at me and they say, well, you have high blood pressure. So if I have seen that doctor, it's likely that he, he or she will have my record on my previous visit. Even if I've seen a different doctor in the same hospital or in the same clinic, sometimes they don't even have access to my record from the last visit. So when we talk about an integrated platform, our goal is, at least in the US is, because we are not going to move everybody to a single system. We wanna make sure that all the, these different systems at least talk to each other in a language that's consistent and, and it's easy to integrate and then create a single virtual platform that can connect two hospitals. So if I show up in one hospital and then this, and they say, well, because of this, we need to take another MRI. So what, what I've seen in Pakistan, and it's no different from what I've seen here is people who have taken an MRI, you know, they, they go around to different hospitals with the, with the CD because that has this MRI on it. I mean, think about we're living in the 21st century and even in a country as, a, as advanced in US, you know, people are expected to carry around those CDs because those two hospitals or two doctors don't talk to each other. And the, and the long and short of it is, if you are going to have a, um, if they want you to take another MRI, if you don't have the old one on record, they would force you to do another one. And guess who's paying for it? You, as a patient. So Pakistan, which is primarily a cash uh, or self-insured market, having such capability where people can have a portable health record, where they can take that information with them, either through a portal or something, would be an enormous value add uh, as I think about, um, as I think about uh, healthcare in Pakistan.
Indeed. I think and Hamza will touch on that when, when we talk to him. You know, one of the buzzword now is about health informatics, use of artificial intelligence, machine learning. How have these things helped you in creating that seamless service for the clinicians and also for providers and the patient? So our company, Change Healthcare, you know, we, we have a, um, we think of ourselves as an AI first company. And what that means is as we try to solve problems, we think about how AI can be used to solve that problem. In the, in the US and across the, across the world, AI, uh, healthcare is a very human intensive business. Yes. You know, you cannot replace a nurse. You can't say, you know, oh, we'll take care of yourself, go read something and fix your, uh, you know, your cancer. It's not going to be that way. You can't just sit in a machine which will give you injection. It's a very, very human centric thing. So you cannot remove the human from healthcare, from healthcare delivery. So as we think about AI, what we have been trying to do is to mechanize or automate as much of the non-human aspects of healthcare. So for example, if a, a, if, if, if a um, so the way it traditionally works, it's a very simple example, is, is a doctor, when you go visit a doctor, the doctor will actually speak her notes through voice and it gets stored with your record because the doctors don't want to sit and type your healthcare information into the system. So what has happened is over the last 10 years is those voice records actually are then shipped to countries like India or Philippines. And there they actually listen to those and then they type it into the healthcare system, healthcare EMR, so that the doctor doesn't have to do that in real time. Now you think about how much cost is incurred to actually do that simple thing. So where AI comes in, and like I said, it's a very simple example, where AI comes in is AI actually replaces that human being. Where it understands you train the AI system in this specific example, to train them to understand what was said, convert that into medical language, and on top of it, convert it to that person um, as to how she speaks, not their accent or the or things they say. But for example, there are uh, the last time I was checked, I I was doing some project, and we found that there were at least eight different ways that doctors talk about penicillin. Because every health practice have their own code words for everything. So a doctor would not say, you know, this patient is allergic to penicillin, therefore don't give him penicillin in the future. They're not going to say that. It's, it's, it's an easy way to do it. But some would say, hey, don't give them penny. Well, it doesn't make any sense, but that's what they're used to. So your AI system, you know, so they end up training the person in Philippines to understand that Dr. You know, Mary Jones, you know, doesn't talk about penicillin. When she says penny, that means penicillin. So you train your systems to understand how every doctor talks about specific things. So you take out their entire human part in the healthcare system and eventually you end up saving some money. So that's a very, very rudimentary example of how AI is being used to simplify and cut down the cost in healthcare. So that's one. The second one, which is much more advanced is, today what happens is, uh, you know, when somebody takes a chest, chest X-ray, you know, sometimes those chest X-rays are sent over to India as an example, where somebody looks at the chest X-ray and says, you know, this special, the report, the small little report that comes with the chest X-ray, many times now it's been written by people who don't live in the US because they're trying to do cost arbitrage. So if it takes $100 for some US-based physician to read an X-ray, probably takes $3. I don't know what the numbers are. So where AI comes in is that there are these pattern recognition AI that actually can process your X-ray and say, that they are finding some 
they're finding nothing or they're finding some issue. And if they find an issue, then those things are specifically routed to a, to a qualified physician. Everything else is just a computer generated report and say, X-ray is clear. So this is, this is considered diagno a diagnostic AI, yeah. where you're trying to diagnose things without human intervention, or at least process it at layer one. So I think this question at Kashif is extremely important because as I think about Pakistan, there are, you know, I was part of Crestsoft, which was one of the first software houses in Pakistan. So what we learned from that experience is practically in my personal opinion, 9-11 uh, killed the Pakistani offshore industry because you know, we couldn't get any visa to, to send anybody to be on site. So that's my personal, personal view. But so there are two ways to think about healthcare opportunity. One is that there is enormous opportunity with the fifth largest population in the world to improve healthcare in Pakistan either through technology, through services. And then the second opportunity is, is how can Pakistani entrepreneurs play a role in the global healthcare IT scene? So that doesn't mean you know, sending doctors or exporting doctors as talent. I, I mean, on a high healthcare perspective. So one of the things that you would hear, you, you know, I would challenge everybody to think about is, what are some of the things that we can do to catch the next wave of innovation on a global level. And I think the next wave of innovation on a global level is AI in healthcare. Why? Because that's not something that you require a US visa to go. That's not something that the science is available to everyone. Indeed. And that's something you can build in Pakistan and license to others. And as you think about it, I know so many folks, very, very wealthy individuals from India that are now getting India ready for the journey of AI, primarily so that they can become a world leader in AI. And I have friends who live and work in China. So as an example, they tell me that relative to US, China is already at least five years ahead at least five years ahead in AI because they have tens of thousands of PhDs that are specialized in AI because they have decided that the 21st, rest of the 21st century and maybe the 22nd century is all going to be about AI. It's not going to be about small things. So AI in healthcare, AI in supply chain, AI in uh, telecommunication, it's going to be everywhere. Why? Because you can change, you can make a significant impact on the cost of delivering service. So for me, as I think about opportunities for Pakistanis in Pakistan, there's a lot that can be done on the technology stage and for the services stage. But when it comes to thinking about playing on a global stage, AI may be the next wave that we as a country need to catch because that's an open territory right now. And, you know, picking up on that, for Pakistan, the, one of the big issues for us is misdiagnostic. And the example you give is very poignant where they actually look through the x-ray and they can pick up loads more things than probably a human eye can. Do you, is this technology very expensive? And, uh, and how can somebody with the entrepreneurial mind can, can start to explore those? So the technology itself is free you can buy a lot of AI tools that are open source, okay? The real goal, the real issue is the data because AI is nothing without the data. So, so there are the two things, you know, technology quote unquote IP is available all over the place. You can download it, you can use Amazon cloud, everybody has something. The real thing is to figure out how do you fine tune that AI engine for it to do what you want it to do. And that requires data. Data, for example, is for this X-ray example, you have to scan the X-ray. You have to scan millions of X-rays, as an example, to train your AI engine to pick on things because it's not gonna pick everything on day one. First, you'll train it on tumors. 
then you will train it on bleeds. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I'm just making stuff up. So, so the point is that's where, you know, a doctor partnering with a computer scientist is, is an excellent example of, you know, co-founding or building something together. Um, because you need a doctor to know, hey, this is probably tumor. Let's look at these patterns in the X-ray. And then an AI scientist who's primarily trained as a computer science person and or has significant knowledge in AI is somebody that can help design, feed the data into those engines, which are readily available. And, and that's, that's the key because these things the, with the open source world, I mean, the, the, the landscape for IT is pretty flattened. Anybody can be sitting anywhere to do very, very incredible things. Which what we, and I, I can't be the person, I, I'm not the right person to comment on the state of AI talent in Pakistan. But all I can tell you is a, company, a country that has had substantial experience, even you know, Israel or India, that are investing enormous amount of money. They are actually starting with creating AI institutes where they are training computer science people to use those tools, to program those tools, to configure those tools. So that I think is the next wave when I talk about is, is, is pick a problem and don't, because you can't have an AI engine that does everything. It, and that's another, you know, you can't build one software system that will read all x-rays. So you can start with, let's say, a tumor, then bleeds or whatever else. But these are things that will happen over a period of time. But for that, you need some substantial AI experience, which I think is, would be a good place to make some investments. One of the things was the telemedicine. Uh, the term has been used in Europe for a long time. Pakistan experiencing now because of COVID. Where is uh, the telemedicine is heading in US and what can Pakistan learn in application of that? Because uh, we can, one of the issue in Pakistan is about uh, having access to basic care in rural areas and how in your view, uh, some entrepreneurs can think around using telemedicine to reach out to those areas. Yeah, so there is, I think, you know, it's like I said, this is one of those exciting areas where Pakistan can leapfrog everybody and there's a lot to be learned in, in countries that are you know, similar to ours. So, so in the US, so there's a, you know, there's a very large population of people that live in rural areas. And in order for them to get good care, they have to drive 50, 100 miles to go to the nearest hospital to get good care. And so if you live in New York, you don't have to drive that far. But when, if you live in the middle of um, you know, Kansas, you may have to go 50, 70 miles to go see a cardiologist. And, and uh, so telemedicine, if there wasn't a COVID, telemedicine wasn't really taking off because again, this is a disadvantage, not an advantage. US has spent trillions of dollars building hospitals and clinics, physical hospitals and clinics. Now, what they want to do is that they want you to come to the hospital or the clinic because they have a sunk cost. They wanna get you come there so they can make a, a profit on those locations. So they were not necessarily encouraging people to do telemedicine because then how would they go, you know, how will they get payback on their major hospital building or the machines, et cetera. So COVID has changed all that. So, in my personal view, Pakistan has an enormous opportunity to leapfrog all that. Just like Africa has leapfrogged completely when it comes to mobile phones. I mean, they've entirely bypassed the landline phase and everybody seems to have a mobile phone. Similarly, Pakistan has an enormous opportunity to leapfrog all this, uh, all this you know, brick and mortar infrastructure and move to telemedicine very rapidly, where people actually can get telemedicine on smartphones. Now, as we know that Pakistan has a very large you know, cell phone network, the same cell phone network can be used to do what we are doing, Zoom meetings. So we have an opportunity to leapfrog that, 
and provide access to care where people are rather than force them to get on a bus and come you know 120 miles to lahore and and so i think that is an enormous opportunity and i when i look at the countries that are similar to ours i mean they have they are building these homemade um, you know satellite phones that actually are and they have created these pods that they have put you know in in villages where you just go sit in the pod and the pod has a satellite based very low cost satellite based internet system and then you can basically see and the pods are very cheap to build they are not like sophisticated build and then you can go consult now so from an infrastructure perspective telemedicine has enormous potential for pakistan the challenge is going to be how do you cover that cost and you know if if i and i know many physicians in pakistan who tell me that they get you know they they're based in karachi so they tell me they have patients who come all the way from peshawar because they like the doctor and th their mother was treated by this doctor and she lived a long life so now they come from peshawar to see the same doctor now think about the time and effort and these people are actually you know sometimes they have to spend 10 20 30 40000 dollars rupees just to come and then they may or may not pay fee because the doctor may say don't worry about it but that cost that pain and suffering can be reduced uh, by creating this telemedicine based access because not everything needs uh, a physical um, examination many things don't and it could be a great way to triage okay you have to come see me versus keep taking your medication i like what i see good luck so i think this is this is the kind of innovative thinking that i think folks like folks like yourself are doing is let's try to leapfrog let's not try to mirror or copy what you as did because what we did is messed up i mean it's in a really bad shape because we have done it over a period of time and pakistan can just learn from it and just skip all the noise and in one of the interviews with the US news channel I was listening to the other day you talked about the covid and you talked about the the experience of technology what how that can assist clinicians and also self diagnostic in terms of how you can actually do that can you just give an example of how we can use technology in pakistan because coverage is patchy to actually make sure that people and also the clinician are actually picking those patient up early so we can reduce the spread of virus in rural areas so it's it's been a struggle in the us to try to educate the public on how deadly covid can be for them as you know we have a lot of challenges around mask wearing but ultimately for a company like change healthcare what we have been doing is we have been making it easier for patients to get tested for covid now um it's very hard for people and i can't imagine i can't imagine how difficult it is in pakistan it's very hard for people to know where to go to get a covid test it's very hard for people to know how they're tested it's also very hard to know or, or not trivial to understand what are the symptoms of covid and when they should go and when they shouldn't so based on the early needs that the market had we created these systems where somebody can go find a doctor they can go find a lab that does covid testing they can see how quickly you know what is the backlog for a certain lab and how quickly they can uh, test because some labs have a backlog of 6 days so if you're feeling the symptoms you go for test you won't know until for 6 days so what do you do self quarantine what if 6 days later it comes back and says all you had was flu right so we our goal was to try to make it easy for people to get tested and make it easy for them to know where to go and make it easy for them to get results back so that was the fundamental goal we had and now we are transitioning into a new phase which is the phase of vaccine vaccine passport which is once you have taken the vaccine short of you carrying that piece of paper that says you've taken that shot and uh, you know it's a paper so it you know get may it may get lost you know we are building a passport type thing where you can just flash your app and then it will have a qr code 
that can be scanned to see if you are test vaccinated or not. So there are these specific point solutions that have been built and are starting to get used um, in a market as large as US. And I think it's a good time to invite Hamza in it with his experience of it. Hamza, can you uh, welcome to the, uh, the webcast. For audience, Hamza Iqbal is the founder and CEO of HealthWire, a health tech startup focused on aggregating the old stakeholder health ecosystem on its platform and providing a seamless digital healthcare experience to patients. HealthWire is a graduate of NIC LUMS, form, uh, formerly the LCE, and Hamza has raised 700,000 US dollars for 46 ventures, and it is a Pakistan focused venture capitalist fund. Welcome, Hamza. Uh, you just heard Faisal Saab mention a lot of opportunities and how the model is working in US. Can you just give your experience of uh, starting up the healthcare uh, venture in Pakistan? And what opportunity you see in that the use of technology for benefit of patient and clinicians? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kashif, for the introduction. Uh, so I think there are immense uh, opportunities uh, locally, and as uh, Faisal has very elaborately mentioned, there are immense opportunities that Pakistanis have of catching the next waves. Uh, so if I if I start speaking about the local industry, I think. Uh, the healthcare ecosystem uh, is very fragmented. Uh, there's a disconnect between different stakeholders and that's thing it's waiting for technology to come in uh, it's right at the cusp where technology comes in and solves these major healthcare problems to improve uh, healthcare outcomes. Um, you know, speaking from, you know, the basic problems of digitizing doctors, uh, healthcare clinics, you know, to the more complex problems that uh, Faisal has been speaking about. Uh, there, there are immense things that uh, need to be done. Uh, we need a lot more people coming into this industry with more expertise to solve these problems. Uh, and then we have the other opportunities that lie across the borders. And as Faisal has very elaborately mentioned, AI is definitely the next wave that's going to disrupt healthcare. And uh, I think Pakistan should definitely have eyes on that. And if you give your experience of uh, starting the portal, again, from your perspective of a non-medical person, what interest do you to come to healthcare and uh, what was the motive behind it? I think, uh, so uh, then again, as Faisal has mentioned, uh, we, we see a lot of examples of people coming in from other industries uh, into healthcare, and that's what uh, all entrepreneurship is all about. You know, most of the industries that are being disrupted are not being done by the people that belong to that that specific industry. Uh, so, so, uh, so the opportunity. So, so that's I think uh, the main. Uh, thing that attracted me to uh, healthcare was the impact that it could bring. I think uh, uh, it all started up with a brief problem when I looked up to find a doctor and I couldn't find any. But I think the initial experiences really exposed the system to me and the immense potential that technology has to improve outcomes. Uh, because this is, uh, this is a sector which is uh, very alien to technology, we see uh, only 97 to 98% of the doctors using any EHR in Pakistan. Uh, so that's why I think uh, the impact that technology can bring to this industry is very exciting. I think this specific uh, reason uh, brought me to this place. And one of the things what Castle was mentioning is about the use of AI and data plays a central role in it. And with your experience, how uh, systems, IT systems in Pakistan to capture the clinical data about patient and patient records, how well is that developed uh, across the country with your experience? I think unfortunately we're lagging far behind because I think uh, the main problem at this time is not about capturing that data and you know utilizing it in other means. I think the first and foremost thing we need to do is capturing as much as data as we could, because as I was saying, uh, at this point in time, there are many, there, the, the number of doctors that are using uh, any kind of software, the number of hospitals that are using software to store health information are very low. And 
the utility of these softwares that are being used is very low. So I think the first, uh, the problem that we really need to more concentrate on at this point in time is to making sure that most of the data that is being accumulated, uh, patient health records data, whether it's on uh, outdoor side where the doctor consults with the doctor or whether the patient gets admitted to the hospital, there should be a digital trace of their data. Uh, and I think when we reach a point when uh, the, the considerable data is being produced, uh, that's where I think uh, the next question that you've asked would come in. Uh, but definitely uh, at this point in time, we need to make sure uh, that as uh, I think uh, Faisal talked about that the problem that the US has been facing is that uh, the system, uh, because the market is so saturated, go from one hospital to another, the, the, there's no one communication channel where all data that is being uh, digitized can be accessed from. We, I think, at this point in time can start thinking about this problem because we'll face it in the future. Uh, but on the ground, I think the first thing we need to do is to increase the adoption of EHRs. And the, you know, the basic health insurance, the government-backed health insurance, do you think that might be a catalyst for private sector and other areas where there could be more use of health technology in that sense? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think uh, it probably has been a big catalyst in US and other developed markets. It can be a catalyst in Pakistan as well because the problems of managing all of these things related to insurance uh, manually are very difficult and time consuming. So it, it definitely triggers the adoption. Uh, but there are other, I think, uh, uh, many other factors also that can trigger uh, adoption. Uh, but insurance is one of the major factors that could be. And uh, Hamza, you are also the NIC uh, graduate. And a um, number of our audience want to hear from you. What was your experience like? And uh, what were the key moments in your uh, time at NIC? Yeah, so NIC has been a big contributor to health care. I think uh, we would probably have not survived uh, if it would not have been because of NIC. I think the biggest contribution that NIC had was uh, on healthware was, you know, helping us approach the problems in the right way. But I think uh, this is something which sounds very obvious, but when it comes to execution, and especially in Pakistan, this uh, uh, when I started healthware, I was a recent graduate, and I had zero knowledge on starting up companies. And I think that's where NIC's direction on solving problems uh, in the lean way, I think, uh, helped us a lot. I think it's very important to, you know, enter the market without, uh, you know, having answers to all of the questions, to, you know, uh, launching your, pro to having a, as much uh, user interactions as possible, to understanding your problem as much as possible before, uh, you know, devising solutions for it and launching your uh, product or service before you think it's, entirely complete. And then these are some things which, which have had phenomenal contribution because uh, we started up as an EHR company and there were many companies before us who ventured into the space, but they, they, they copied, uh, uh, instead of focusing on the needs of the market, they were looking more uh, towards the EHRs uh, that were present outside Pakistan. I think that's that's uh, probably a wrong way to look at this problem. And that's, I think, one of the fundamental things which NIC shaped us on. Yeah, thank you. I'll come back to you, Hamza and Uh Fasa, one of the question uh, our audience asked is uh, one of the two distinct consumer bases the change healthcare has is one is the payer and the other one is the provider. Which one in your experience has been more challenging and how successful is integration these two consumer bases has in increasing the switching the cost of these services. So I think so. Let's let's think about this a little bit. So uh, health plans, you know, is health plans are insurance companies. They're extremely organized. They're very very large, and and there are about two thousand of them in the U.S. 
So when you deal with the health plan sector in the US, you're talking, you're, you're dealing with a very organized sector that is very well managed, maintained, and have a lot of money. You switch over to uh, health providers. So as you, as you see in our numbers, you know, there are 2000, we have about 2000 health plan customers. And we have about 900,000 physicians as customers. So think about, you know, signing 2000 contracts versus signing 900,000 contracts. So in US, every innovation is a non-starter if you can't figure out how to get physicians involved and how to get their mind share to something. So there are about 5,000 hospitals and uh, uh, more than 50% of US physicians don't work for a hospital, which means they have their own business. So as you think about doctors, the, the thing that I learned fairly early was doctors are actually small business owners. They're doing a very noble thing, but ultimately they're small business owners. Every decision they make has to certainly make uh, medical sense, but equally importantly has to make business sense. So you just can't show up to them and say, give me 10 rupees, I'll give this to you because it's a good thing. Their first thing will be, how will this 10, 10 rupees make me 100 rupees? Otherwise, don't waste my time because I'd rather save that 10 rupees. And I think Hamza may have, may have a good understanding of what I'm talking about. So it's, it's dealing with the doctor side is much more, I call it a, it's, it's essentially a, a um, small business, you know, uh, endeavor. You've got to sell feet on the street is very expensive and not every doctor will understand exactly the same value proposition. But when you talk to health insurance, they are very organized, they're very business savvy, and there are fewer of them. So in, in the US, any innovation that does not make sense to the physicians does not take off, even if it makes the most perfect sense. So very completely different dynamics. And therefore, I think it's probably no different in Pakistan where physicians will likely drive, practicing physicians will likely drive the agenda of innovation and how quickly things take shape. So I wanna come back to one of the questions that I think I heard earlier was, you know, the telemedicine. So telemedicine is one of those areas where it, there is an opportunity for existing practicing physicians to not only grow their business, because like I said, think of them as business people. You know, they can see more patients without having to travel to those locations. But also think about the large population of women doctors that are in Pakistan that do not necessarily practice medicine because they may not be, uh, they, it may not be easy for them to, to go to nine to five job or whatever that takes. So telemedicine is one of the places where they don't have to travel as well. So you can actually grow the number of physicians that can participate in delivery, healthcare delivery uh, in remote areas without having to train more physicians and have them go you know, all over the country. So you know, I, I get really excited about telemedicine and its potential in Pakistan. Hamza, do you see that? And uh, do you have any question for Faisal Saab? Uh, because he's talking the language of uh, which might be very resonant to you. Yeah, I do. So I think uh, specifically on telemedicine. Uh, so uh, so uh, what we've experienced uh, about telemedicine in Pakistan, especially in the past year, was that uh, the COVID way, uh, scenario gave, gave a good adoption push. I think uh, as OPD started to open up again, uh, the number of video consultations have overall been declining over the, over the past months. So I think there's, there's, so Pakistan, I think has a lot to learn that we, uh, although adoption has increased, but in terms of telemedicine, what do you think are going to be the key, key drivers that, that can improve uh, uh, its adoption? I mean, uh, for, I mean, I can just, um, you know, hypothesize 
So for me, you know, we are probably we are probably seeing similar similar trends in the U.S. where, as people are more comfortable going to their doctor, at least the urban population, they're starting to move back to in person because they can. It's a five mile drive. It's easy. You know, it's available. But when it comes to telemedicine in the remote areas, at least in the U.S., it's going to stick. And the reason is going to stick is people have really high quality internet at their homes. And when it comes to the follow on visit, when somebody has to drive 100 miles, take a full day off from work, drive 100 miles, wait in the waiting room, and then come back just for a follow on visit, that we, we are seeing that is going to stick. So by, by extrapolating that out to Pakistan where internet is not really of high quality everywhere, there may be an opportunity to uh, create a persistent adoption in telemedicine by providing the infrastructure, not just a capability. And this is what I was saying that I've seen companies in other parts of the world that have created these small little parts that have these you know, built-in internet connectivity. So, and that's and built at a very low price, you know, for uh, low to uh, medium to low income countries. And, and that may be a way to, like I said, leapfrog rather than just try to solve this problem uh, in the urban areas because telemedicine to, to Hamza's point is starting to come down even in the US in the urban areas. One of the things was around the pharmaceutical. I think we, we've been focused around the healthcare in hospital. And Fazasa, with your view, uh, we there is a word around the precision medicine, call it personalized medicine. What are the opportunities for entrepreneurs to look at and uh, people with interest in pharmaceutical to explore the use of technology within pharmaceutical? So <clears throat> there are two people, two groups of people in the US that have all the money. Health insurance companies have all the money. And the second group that actually has the money are pharmaceutical companies. And everybody else is trying to get into their pocket. So the doctor gets paid by the health insurance company and uh, the, the, and the um, pharma gets paid by the health insurance company. So there, these are the two sectors with the deepest pockets. So, you know, when, as I think about US, US is a slightly different market because in pharmaceutical, we have, I think there are about seven, uh, 7,000 drugs in the pipeline which are under research. So, you know, FDA maintains a pipeline of drug that are in, in clinical trials. And so there is a very robust system of drug discovery, drug commercialization. And, uh, you know, there is like countries like Switzerland, US, um, are, are um, maybe UK, um, are the only few countries in the world that actually develop new medications, new drugs. And when we talk about um, uh, personalized medicine, that actually is, is a layer above, which means you know, if the drug was approved for 80% of the population and you are in that 20% of the population that the drug doesn't work for, can you design the molecule in a different way to help you, the 20%, uh, get better care? So I call it the PhD level innovation, not necessarily the um, entry level innovation. It is a trend that is growing, but it's not necessarily very well supported by health plans yet because it's very costly to get into personalized medicine for everybody. So one of the examples of personalized medicine, and this may be interesting for your audience is, you know, traditionally people talk about um, breast cancer or prostate cancer or colon cancer. This is how people talk about cancer. The interesting thing is that that is the wrong way to talk about cancer. Just because you have a cancerous cell in your breast doesn't mean they're all the same. What they have found is that in many of the breast cancer cells, 
sometimes are the same cells that are found in the colon cancer. So the medication for breast cancer in this specific example should be the medication that was used for colon cancer. But you won't know until you do a DNA test on the cancer cell itself to know that this cancer is actually of the colon type. So what the cancer oncology people are moving away from is using these broad terminologies to say, somebody has colon cancer, let's give them colon cancer medication. Because a vast majority of people, it's true. But for a lot of people, their breast cancer is actually a form of colon cancer or a form of skin cancer or pick, pick whatever. So that's where the concept of personalized medicine come in where they're trying to uh, identify the DNA of cancer and then give you medication that actually addresses the type of mutation you have, regardless of where it is. So unless it's something like this, which is part of personalized medicine, it, you know, that, that, that is taken really taken off because it has a very high degree of uh, um, success. And the reason I know this is my one of my colleagues went through this and, you know, it was very fascinating to hear all this and what's going on. Um, so when it comes to a country like uh, a developing country like Pakistan, you know, I think our best example is to think about generic medication. And it becomes a production and a supply chain question. I, I'm not sure whether we have the ecosystem yet, and I'm not suggesting we shouldn't. But when it comes to actionable things next year or two years or three years from now, it's about understanding and getting into the generic medication business. Because right now, for example, Teva, is the, which is the number one generic medication company in the world, is based out of Israel. And they're essentially going and buying every other generic medication company. And then the number two player in the world is India. And the the opportunity in India is, is the reason India is there is because they, in most of these cases, they don't, uh, they don't um, accept patents. They just don't care for them. Uh, they say, okay, this is, this is something that will save lives. We're going to copy it. So when I think about opportunities, I think about the opportunity for us as a country is innovation in, in pharma is, is what can we do and this comes back to the conversation Kash, if you and I were having earlier about regulation. You know, that's an enormous opportunity to improve the regulation when it comes to pharma so that it becomes easier to, to manufacture generic medications in Pakistan, essentially for Pakistanis first, and then potentially to export to Africa or to Central Asian countries. And, and that's, I think, one area where I believe that Pakistan has an advantage, can have an advantage, provided that we have the right regulatory framework, because there's an enormous market. The fundamental difference between, uh, when I think about innovation, it, the fundamental difference between a country like India and a country like China, is China is, has deep roots when it comes to innovation. Why? Because they have built things that can be used by their own population versus India, which is you know, when it comes to IT, none of their, most of the innovations on IT are not used by Indians because they can't afford it. So I think Pakistan is an opportunity to create innovative solutions that are focused on the fifth largest population to start with. And there's enough then momentum to go to exports. Thank you. One of the things Hiba uh, asks, uh, is asking uh, Hamza, is that how you create the awareness among the general public about booking appointments through these health software? Because most Pakistanis still don't trust the online payment system before the checkout. Yes, I think that's a difficult challenge. Uh, I think the best thing that we could do and the thing that we more focused on driving adoption is in making sure the patient experience of those uh, who trust us or uh, trust our service for booking appointments is so seamless that it generates uh, word of mouth or it generates credibility for them to uh, return back on our service. So I think that's 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 something that's in our hands and that's something 
uh, which can create an effect which no other mean can do to drive adoption of online appointments. All right. Hira Fareed has uh, got a question for Faisal Saab. And she asks, so what's the scope of artificial intelligence in the coming years in country like Pakistan, given the procedures usually shifting from invasive to mini minimally invasive all around the world? And what skills do you need to grasp or plan AI setup? So I'm not quite sure I understand the question about India. Uh, Hira is a doctor. She's saying because in Pakistan, we the world is moving to minimum invasive procedures. In Pakistan, we don't really have so much of that. How can we actually tap into that market? And if we want to start up uh, a health uh, in that area, what would be... Uh, how can we grasp or plan uh, if you want to do an AI startup in Pakistan? Given some of the things you mentioned about lack of data and also Hamza backed that up that we don't have a central depository where we can actually get data on that. So, you know, so I think when it comes to AI, it's very important to understand that you have to pick one problem. And uh, let's talk about invasive um, versus uh, um, so that, I think if I understand correctly, that probably means we're talking about operating procedures. Operating procedures, indeed. Yeah. So when it comes to operating procedures, I mean, those are definitely areas where people are investing a lot of money because they're creating these highly automated, uh, uh, meaningfully intelligent machines that can support a surgeon in their surgery process. So like I said, where Pakistan is in its maturity of technology and infrastructure, I think uh, starting with innovating at that level is probably a little too early, which is why I think we have to start with the basic health processes, not necessarily about you know, high performing artificially intelligence aided uh, surgeries, et cetera. Because you know, companies like GE or Siemens are spending billions of dollars building those machines and those technologies. So I, I believe uh, based on my limited experiences that Pakistan in AI, Pakistan has the opportunity to build out um, process improvement AI or diagnostic AI because the barriers to that are very limited. For example, in order for me to generate X-ray data, I don't have to go where all I have to do is to source 100,000 x-ray copies from hospitals and use that as data source. I don't have to go import data. And that's the beauty of AI. It, it's a level playing field. But if you pick a problem and then you, you, can you find the data to solve that problem, because if you have a really good idea and you cannot get to data, AI doesn't work. So stop find something else. But if you can find data, then you can go do a lot of interesting things. For example, let's think about this Apple new watch. That watch can tell you whether somebody is going to suffer a heart event. So, you know, think about, you know, is there rocket science in there? Maybe, likely not. All they've done is they've collected enormous amount of data, uh, heart rhythm data, and they have put this through their machines, which is you know, AI machines that, like I said, are available on, online. And then based on those, whenever they catch a signal, they say, okay, there's something going on here. And they keep training the machine based on the data until they say, okay, there's a 90% probability if this heart, heart rhythm shows up, within 30 seconds, something else is gonna happen. So these are, these are training processes, which you have continuously improved. But if Apple can do it, you know, you don't need Apple's type of money to actually do what they did. Um, it's actually essentially two people in a room can do this as long as you have access to data. But it, it then has enormous implications for a lot of other things we do. So that's why I think AI could be the next frontier for Pakistan. But we just need to make sure that we are thinking about AI in context of where we are as a country from a develop, developed infrastructure of technology, rather than just try to do what, you know, what um, some of the other very advanced countries are doing. And there's plenty to do. Yeah. So you, 
That's right. And as you said, I think if you focused on diagnostic where we really got that data available in some form and gathering them and making use of that for the benefit of the users, that might be an easier option for Pakistan. So thanks, uh, Faisal, for that. One of the questions for Hamza is, please share your thoughts and experience of turning an idea into workable, financially prudent business venture. And uh, what skills and young entrepreneurs need in Pakistan? So I think uh, on the skills needed, I think uh, the fundamental skill would be uh, the core of entrepreneurship and that's a relentless uh, pursuit of the problem you're trying to solve. Because in the end, uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, there's a problem that you see and you start pursuing that problem without having you know, a solution in mind or not. Uh, that problem is uh, where it all gets started and uh, that's what uh, anyone looking to pursue this field should be uh, you know, focusing on. Uh, that's uh, finding a problem that they're passionate about, finding a problem that, uh, that, that you know, excites them, that triggers them uh, you know, to go at lengths to solve that problem. Uh, so so I, that's, that's the second part of the question. Uh, could you pre uh, please repeat the first part? Of your thoughts of turning an idea into business venture, which is financially prudent. Yeah, I think uh, in the context of Pakistan, it, it, it's getting uh, the, this market is uh, really uh, you know catching up, picking up pace, which which is helping entrepreneurs you know with uh, uh, as venture capital comes in as more and more experienced. Uh, Pakistanis coming in from other countries come in as more and more mentors are pitching in. It's it's assisting entrepreneurs. And I think that's uh, what all of us need. It's more uh, well, that's what entrepreneurs uh, need uh, when they uh, venture out on solving this problem. <clears throat> Faisal sir, Pakistan is a young nation. Sixty percent of our population is under the age of thirty-five. We highly skilled, have some opportunities. Freelancing in Bangladesh is picked up in greatly. What do you see the opportunity of freelancing is within the healthcare technology? So I'm not necessarily very familiar with this term. So what does that mean in this context? Freelancing would be the people who actually work through different uh, portals where they can do data analytics, they can do basic infrastructure development, and these people can then be hired by a company globally and they can work remotely. And Pakistan's one big thing is because a number of our female doctors, when they get married, they actually leave the profession. And what they like to do is use more of the opportunities within the healthcare technology to be able to use the education and the skills and the passion they have for the community. And any opportunities you believe that they can utilize uh, working from home or where they have more work-life balance? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I, I can't comment on that because I am not very familiar with the freelancing, you know, market. You know, if, if you know, my, my view is pretty simple. You know, when it comes to India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, you know, we have a very basic parity in uh, skills, and uh, IT infra uh, uh, internet infrastructure. So I think that I know several, um, I've heard of several websites where you can go register and they really don't care if you are you know, sitting in Bangladesh, if you have the right credentials and you have the right uh, certificates and uh, you have the right availability, you know, they'll take you. It's not about them, people taking you from Bangladesh or otherwise. Is it, it just takes a lot of time and effort to find the, the thing you want to work on and to fine tune your your hourly rate and things you can do and can't do. One of the things that helps either it's freelancing or otherwise is a very strong work ethic, uh, which which means that do what you said and said what you uh, you know and uh, and walk the talk, which sounds cliche, but it's easier said than done. And if you commit to something, you know, in the, in the culture that we live in here. If you commit to something, you'll do it. Um, you know, if it means you work after midnight or before, you know, 6 a.m. Or, or during the middle of the day, people really don't care. You got to do what you said you will. 
So that may not, that's probably no different in, in freelancing. So it fits nicely with the, you know, flexible schedule requirements that some of the folks may have. So I'm not, I can't say uh, whether Pakistan has an opportunity. I think it's an equal playing field. I think our credentials are as, as uh, acceptable as uh, Bangladeshi or Indian credentials, I would think. Um, but I think it comes down to, you know, there is, I, I still believe that Pakistan as a country uh, really needs to think about how we can use our talent for our own people rather than continue to provide the labor to Middle East or the brain trust to Western countries. Um, and I just bought a bunch of uh, gloves, um, paid uh, some pretty penny for it. And when I got it, uh, it had one of the highest rating on Amazon. When I got it, it said um, made in Pakistan. And I can assure you, not even 5% of that money actually went to the manufacturer in Pakistan. It's absolutely guaranteed. So we need to step away from trying to build other people's businesses. It may sound easy, actually it's not. We have to think about how we can build our own country because there are things like Hamza is doing. It's an enormous need. Uh, the question, Kash, if you talked about rural health is an enormous gap and an opportunity. I mean, I know people who come from all over the country to Karachi and Lahore and pay a lot of money to see a specialist. How can we make that easier? How can we make that easier? So, you know, yes, freelancing may be a thing to do, but I think there's plenty to do in Pakistan, for Pakistan. And one of the questions somebody, Adnan Bakar asked, can you mention some areas or opportunities where AI can be used for advanced healthcare research? And it's similar to one that you mentioned for image processing and cancer diagnostic. Are there any other areas where uh, clinical research can benefit from that? I mean, so, so I, I don't quite understand the, the meaning of the word. The areas research. where uh, if you're doing health research into COVID or other areas, where we can gather data and then use the AI principles to look at the patterns and come up with the, uh, either the solution in terms of diagnostic or treatment of them. Mm -hmm. And where with your technology hat on, where there might be any opportunities for people to get into it. So one of the biggest problem, uh, one of the biggest mysteries in COVID as an example is being, you know, some people die, others don't, why? You know, um, why is it the lethality of this, um, this virus is, is so different for some people and not for others? And based on some of the data we have looked at is what are the underlying health reasons for why somebody is sicker than others? So for example, diabetes is one example. And, uh, you know, people who have high blood pressure is another example. People who have blood clotting, um, disease have that. So those discoveries of those things that I just talked about were done through data analytics. I'm not sure I would call it AI, but I mean, anybody can call anything AI, but the point is looking at that data in Pakistan for the Pakistani population and figuring out whether, what are the reasons, what are the underlying reasons for why some people are dying and others are not is, is one way that data analytics has been used to figure out where this disease is going or where what causes what. So the causation is, is very important around clinical research. Similarly, you know, once somebody has the disease, using the treatment data that gets collected in the hospital, which I know is a challenge in Pakistan, using that data to know what medication will work on what person, why, and why not. And that's another a very important thing that has been going on in the US where there are, there are people who are using remsedivir, um, can't remember, I can't uh, pronounce that drug name, but there are, there are three or four different type of drugs that can be used when somebody has COVID and figuring out which one will actually work. So that's actually, again, an observational um, study where you observe what is working and what's not working. And again, again, I won't call it AI, but that's how data analytics, which is also an extremely important field um, to drive some of those uh, um, treatment pathways. 
So if you know, you, you know, if, if people over the age of I'm just making this up, people if people over the age of 55 uh, who have no comorbid situation, you know, if they're serious COVID patient, should they be given oxygen? Some people are saying it's not intubating is not an issue, it's not a solution. You can actually kill them. Increase the amount of oxygen in their, uh, you know, that you're feeding them, that should be good enough. So that's an observational study. So my point is AI is, 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 is very interesting, but there's enormous opportunity to do data analytics, uh, which is simpler than AI, to get to similar um, outcomes on treatment uh, pathways and, and, uh, and uh, uh, diagnostic pathways. Thank you. One question for Hamza, and uh, it is uh, from one of the audience about where do you think your website goes next? Where does the HealthWire's future lie and uh, its development? Yeah, so currently we have the largest healthcare platform with uh, 4,000 doctors, uh, backend offices we have digitized. And, uh, uh, we carry about 6 million patient records. Moving forward, we intend to connect these doctors uh, to patients. Uh, they are a seamless portal where patients can book appointments. We are currently, the booking appointment facility that we have is more focused on uh, in cities, in, in the top cities of the country, that's Karachi, Islamabad, and Lahore. Uh, we intend to uh, geographically expand this to all metro cities. Uh, Apart from this, I think telemedicine is something uh, which we have a very uh, close eye on. Uh, during uh, the lockdown period, we, we, we started the service. Uh, we had good adoption. Now we, as I was mentioning, the numbers uh, have decreased. And I think moving forward this, uh, we see telemedicine playing a big part in solving our healthcare pro problems. And uh, moving forward, I think uh, uh, connecting doctors to remote patients is, is uh, number one in our list. Thank you. Uh, Professor, what's your message for our young health uh, entrepreneurs and how they can follow in your footsteps in following the benefits of the healthcare technology for the benefit of patient providers and the society as a whole? Yeah. So I think, you know, let's, let's, I'll start, I'll end where I started, which is healthcare is not a business. It, it, uh, it's a mission. So entrepreneurs, the one thing that you can all do and think about is be very clear why you are in this business, because you can be, you know, doing a lot of other things. You know, and most of the entrepreneurs that I know in healthcare are not doctors. So if you're a doctor, I get it. Um, you know, that may be the pathway for you. Uh, but if you are in the healthcare, if you want to be a healthcare entrepreneur, um, think about why you want to be in this business. What do you want to get out of it? This is a business of compassion. This is a business of, uh, which has a mission around it. So this is, and to me, this is not necessarily a way to become famous. It's not necessarily a way to have, you know, feed my ego. It's about doing the right thing for a lot of people because all of us are healthcare consumers. Our parents, our brothers, sisters, our children, they're all healthcare consumers. So it's very important to have the, in my, in my personal view, the right mindset. And when I go out and recruit talent, I, I am really trying to understand why they want to come work in a healthcare company. Because if it's just another job, it's it's a lot of hard work and there is not a lot of fame and glory. So I would encourage everybody to think about their fundamental reasons for why they want to be healthcare entrepreneur. It's very different from being an, another type of entrepreneur. That's number one. Most of the healthcare entrepreneurs I know have a personal story on what they're trying to do. Is was the reason There is a reason for why they're doing it. People who are very busy, very focused on diabetes, have a mother or a father or a child who was diabetic. So they have a really personal reason to be doing what they want to do. That's what gives them the passion and the mission. So think about that. That's number two. Number three is make sure whatever you do, and I always remember when I was at Harvard, 
you know, one of the class, one of my class teachers uh, in entrepreneurship said, look, guys and girls, some of you are going to end up in jail. I know that some of you are going to fail, but a lot of you are actually going to do something meaningful, may not be financially, but otherwise. And you are, you have to make a decision which group you want to be in. Because, it, you know, there is many ways to make money. And like I, like, you know, he said, you know, several people will end up in jail. I mean, this is Harvard Business School. Most of the world's most famous crooks were educated at Harvard. So they know this. So they said, have the right reason, have the right passion, and have always have your legacy in mind. What do you want people to remember you about it when you're no longer around? Because legacy about is about how people remember you. And they will not remember if the, if the only thing they can say is you were super rich, but you were a mean, ugly person. Is that what you want to be known for? And healthcare is one of the few, few places where you can really build a legacy that people will remember you for the right things you did. And I mean, obviously you want to make some money as well. So make sure you have the right reasons for why you're doing this. Make sure you're doing it with compassion and make sure you're doing it with highest integrity because the only currency you have and you will have for the rest of your career is going to be your integrity. And if you have your integrity, then you have everything and then people will continue to trust you. They would want to work with you. They want to work for you and they would want to give you all they have because they know that you are a good friend, you're a good person, and most importantly, you are a compassionate person. Hard work is never enough. All of us work really, really hard, but not all of us are at the same level of success, either financially or personally or family-wise. So just keep those few things in mind. And I know I'm kind of preachy here, but that's what I, what I learned from entrepreneurs working with them is it's, it's, everybody has very different reasons and people who are in it for money or fame usually doesn't end well for them. Because as soon as they realize that the money is not there or the fame is not there, they drop their mission and try to move to something else. Entrepreneurship is, is, is very, very hard. It is not trivial. And you're going to fail more times than you're going to be successful. And if you're doing it for the right reasons, you're not going to run from it, from whatever you are committed yourself to. So think about that, um, you know, and um, ha I'm happy to be of help to anyone that wants to directly connect with me. But I think uh, those were, those would be my parting words. Thank you. First of all, I'm grateful and I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Thank you, Hamza. And I think a number of people will take uh, some positives out of it because, uh, as you said, healthcare is about making change to the society and leaving a legacy. And I'm thankful for your time. I know it's early morning in New York. And Hamza, thank you for after a long day at work. So with that, I conclude and I'm thankful to the audience for listening. And as uh, Faisal Saab said, uh, we will share the contact details. So if you want to link up and inshallah, we'll be in touch with Faisal Saab again and invite them to come and speak to our healthcare students. Thank you and have a lovely time. Thank you, everyone.